<laughs> uh, I want to relieve y'all's mind that chapter 7 is really short, and the way it was originally, we was probably going to get out of here early, but I figured out a way to extend it for the full hour. I didn't want y'all to, you know, be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> you already know when I get up here, I ain't shutting up for an hour, am I? <laughs> Father, thank you, Lord, for your word, and we yield to you here tonight. There ain't nobody here who wants to hear me. God, we come here to be taught by you, and we just pray that your spirit would take over, uh, God, and that you would uh, encourage us from your word, and that you'd be glorified in our midst. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 7. <clears throat> Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1, my son, keep my words, uh, the word for words is emer, it means sayings, promises, it's the, if you go and translate the Hebrew into Greek, like if you use the Septuagint, that's the same, it's logos, it's the declaration, it's the promise of God. Okay, so keep my sayings, my promises, Okay. And treasure my commands within you. That's just simple parallelism from Hebrew poetry. Here's the thing, verse 2. Keep my commands and live. It's up there. Keep my commands and live. And my law as the apple of your eye. Okay. What, what it made me think of when I read, you keep my commands and live live. I, I, you can almost hear the heart of God coming at you and saying that this is the way to life. My, my word, my spirit, my wisdom, the understanding that we can build from being in this relationship in the day to day, on the supervision, the teaching, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the life, the energy, that energizing that happens to me when I get up, that's the Holy Spirit doing that. That's live. And I don't mean just exist and your heart's beating and you're consuming food and drinking water and. Huh? I'm talking about live with a sense of purpose. There's that booming again. And a sense of direction. Live. Let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 16, and I want to remind you what he said to the nation of Israel when God said that when this, this, when this has been his de declaration from the beginning. You remember when we talked about it in the Gospel of John, that what was God's declaration, the logos that became flesh? Live! I want to look at that, okay? We're going to look at a piece of it, and then we're going to come back and look at a piece of it again. Ezekiel chapter 16, if you don't want to turn there, you don't have to, you just need to listen to me. Uh, we'll start in verse 6. Uh, Ezekiel had said, the word of the Lord came to me, and you say to Jerusalem concerning her abominations and all these things that I have against her. But in verse 6 he said, this is the Lord speaking to, is, to Israel. Uh, when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And God said to us, live. Keep my commandments and live. Enter this relationship and live. Take a hold of this grace and forgiveness and, and engage in this redemption and live. Because you're dead. He saw Jerusalem swimming in your own blood, struggling in your own blood, dead, separated from me. Live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again, I looked upon you. In I want you to hear the heart of the Father here, okay? I passed you again, I looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love, uh, so I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness, yes I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, that's our relationship with God through Christ, are you seeing the parallel here? 
You became mine, says the Lord God. Then I wash you in water. Water is typology of the Word. We come to church, we get washed with the water. I thoroughly washed off your blood and I anointed you with oil. That means I healed you up and made you healthy. I clothed you in the embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of Fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastries of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty. It was perfect through my splendor which I had bestowed upon you, says the Lord God. They had entered into a covenant with God. They had been keeping his commandments. They hadn't cheated on him with that adulteress, with that seductress, with that immoral woman that we've been studying about in Proverbs, with Antichrist, with Babylon, with the world. They hadn't entered into idolatry and cheated on God. That way. They hadn't considered him to be unimportant or, or been indifferent or apathetic towards him. It set him off to the side. He was the apple of their eye. Is he the apple of our eye? Now look, I, I know that that we, we we get really good at saying the right thing. We can give the conditioned responses and make the appropriate answers and say the politically correct things. We know that in this crowd of people that if I say this, that's going to be unacceptable. If I say this, it's going to be acceptable. What I'm talking about in our hearts. Are we willing to make his word, his church, his bride, this life and this relationship and this family a priority here? Because I can say anything. You put me in, I'd have been a good politician because, uh, I, 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 okay, okay what's, what's the right word? A, a, a wordsmith. I, I got the gift of gab. But if we truly yielded our hearts to the Lord, because it's what he wants, because he caught me struggling in my own blood, I'd gotten trapped in the cords of my own sin and snared by my own iniquities, I was dead. He received me, he blessed me, he loved me, he clothed me, he put me to work, he gave me purpose. Enter this process. So, my son, I want you to keep my words, my promises to you, my sayings to you, my declaration, my logos, and treasure my commands within you. We saw this morning that the command was a light and the law was a lamp. That we didn't stumble around in obscurity and in darkness and ignorance. My, uh, I want you to keep my law as the apple of your eye. I want you to bind them on your fingers. What's that speak of? I don't have, uh, 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 it's a wedding band. Your God is interested in being in a lasting relationship with you that's committed, and it's committed to him and no one else. Write them on the tablet of your heart. We've talked about that before. I want you to say to wisdom... You're my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. Now, we're not talking about, we're not talking about human relationships or human sexual immorality. Of course, we are. That's a factor in it, the way we have our friendships and relationships, the way we view our uh, human relationships on, on earth and the flesh. It's a reflection of the way that we view God, and so we don't want to be cheating and being immoral and this kind of, but what he's talking about is something greater 
We're talking about our relationship with Him. I want this to be sincere and genuine. I don't want you to tell me you're my friend and then not be in the background. I had enough of that in the drug world. That's what God's saying too. Just be honest with me. If you don't like me, I don't. That's okay. I can live without it. Just don't be honest with me and don't tell me I'm. Oh, I'm your buddy. I'm your buddy. Your speech is smoother than oil and it drips, honey. That's not interesting. That's flattery and it's insulting. We need to be honest. Well, God is the same way. Honest, genuine, sincere. If you don't want nothing to do with him, he can handle your honesty. But the days of us playing games with the Lord and pretending and playing church are over. It's time to get serious with God. I'm not trying to beat you up, talk bad to you, and yell at you. But somebody's got to beat you up and yell at you and talk bad to you. I'm not saying that you're doing anything wrong, but if we don't remind each other of these hard, cold facts that God is not someone to play with. I'm not saying he's going to get mad at you and punish you and call down fire from heaven and rain down hell and brimstone on your head. That's not, that's not the way he operates. But at the same time, we don't want to insult our creator who's caught us struggling in our own blood and saved our lives and declared us live and act like that that's just something to be lackadaisical about. He's given us this process. This he, he, has, he came himself in the form of a man and paid the penalty and did everything that he could do to provide life and godliness for us. And we act like, eh, well, it's okay. I'm saved by grace. Eh. We do like that guy we talked about this morning. We wink at sin and immorality. We wink at that stuff. We nudge. We signal to where the family, you know. Or we walk out of here on Sunday and we leave it here. We don't think any more about it. <laughs> Solomon here is playing the witness. Verse 8, verse 6. It happens every time. Every time I get started, I think I get hot and my allergies act up. Verse 6, for at the window of my house, I, I looked through the lattice, and I, I saw, uh, okay, you're getting character with me here, getting character with me here. You're, you're at your house, you're, you're standing there, you're looking out the window, you're staring into the street to see what's going on out there, and this is what you see, okay? Put yourself in character. I looked out the window of my house, I looked through the lattice, I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths. A young man devoid of understanding. Passing along the street near her corner. And he took the path to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black, and the dark night. Oh, how many times have I slipped off when I thought they couldn't nobody see what was going on. Just ignorant to the fact that God was wandering around on my path. He saw it. That all the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. Excuse me. In the black and the dark night when nobody was around, he's slipping around in the street and he wanders off down her path. <laughs> and there a woman met him. Now she's representative of the greater threat, remember, with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. And she was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. <laughs> The loud and rebellious is tempting and attractive to the rebellious nature, isn't it? At times she was outside and at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. She caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. I don't know why 
that it took, now she's representative of the bigger threat. The bigger threat for me seemed to be over the years, and I'm not saying it's exclusive to that. I know that I, I, I can be deceived and I have weaknesses and everything. I got to stay on the path of Jesus, but typically it was drugs and alcohol for me. I don't know how many times that I w took off down this path and got myself into oblivion or in bad health or whatever. I got in jail or I got in a mental hospital or I got in some program or I got something. And I got, I'm down here. I've, I've got under the supervision of the law again. And so I'm down here, and I get healthied up, and I get out, and, I, I, and then I, I, you know, I'm on probation for a while. I walk out on that paper and everything. Okay, so I'm free and clear, right? So I don't, you know, don't want to just immediately bust back out and do this again. But, you know, when I think there ain't nobody looking, I, I told a guy one time, I said, it, it's like, I mean, my life with this thing was like, okay, repeatedly over and over and over at different increments of time and everything. It was like I was going down here to this bar, walking off in the bar. The guy's standing there, the big burly bouncer guy's standing there. And I kept walking back in there repeatedly and going, all right, big boy, I believe I can take you this time. And he's like, you know, this guy was tired of beating me up, tired of beating me up. And he would tear my butt out of the frame again, and then I'd go to, you know, and I'd go to jail and get bound up again, and I'd get healed up, and I'd come immediately, I'd wander back off like him in the dark of the night when I think anybody looking, wander off back in the bar, and here I am again thinking, I believe I can take you this time, and he's like, oh, man. That was my drug addiction. It repeatedly tore my butt out of the frame. I don't know what your weakness is or what the thing is that keeps drawing you. I don't know what the immoral woman is for you. Maybe it is a woman. Maybe it is a man. We can't be messing with that. <laughs> Remember, she, we talked about that her that her, her lips drip honey and her speech was smoother than oil the, the last time or the time before or whatever that was. You remember that? Well, here is some of that. We're going to look at what it looks like when the lips drip honey and the speech is smoother than oil. She said, verse 14, I have peace offerings with me. Today I've made my vows. So I came out to meet who? You. Okay. All right. I came out to meet you. This is all about you, right? Diligently. I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face and I have found you. This is all about you. So cater to the ego, cater to the feelings, cater to the emotions. That's what this whore does. Oh, oh, what? Well, I'm not used to it being all about me and I'm not used to somebody making me feel good. That's what this representative of Babylon of the world does. Anything to get you focused on yourself and off of the Lord. I've spread my bed with tapestry. Colored coverings of Egyptian linen. Oh, it's the good stuff. I've perfumed my bed. It's perfect. Myrrhs and aloes and cinnamon. Boy, those, she's appealing to those senses. Man, you can almost smell that cinnamon. And I, can't you? You can smell it. And you can almost feel the silky smoothness of those Egyptian linens. He's making it tempting. Boy, peel into those senses, you see. Peel into that ego first. Get that ego on board and then get them feelings and emotions on board. And wow, appeal to the senses. And so, okay, I've perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love. Until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Only love, I mean love, I'm talking about love, real love, doesn't have anything to do with that. Real love is about service and faithfulness and commitment and sacrifice it means that i'm going to stick with you through this thing it means that i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to value what you need more than what i want we're going to meet in the middle with this thing that's what the lord does for us he meets our needs in spite we're supposed to meet each other's needs if i'm focused on you and you're focused on me in the middle of that. We're living in love, in real. But that's not what this is. 
That's not what this is. Because that first one says, come let us take our fill of love until morning. The word is dode. It means, actually, it means beloved uncle. <laughs> There's more. Okay. But I just had to throw that out there first. See if y'all was paying attention. It means a, a love token. So it means something that either comes from love or actually more appropriately in this context, it means the token that would purchase sex. The beloved uncle is because in the family, if the woman was going to cheat with somebody, most of the time it was with the uncle. But the word means to boil. Okay, let me give you the definitions here. It's beloved uncle to boil and love token. Let us come take us, let, come let us take our fill of love until morning. That's dode. Let us delight ourselves with love. The word is ahab or ahab or something like that. It means illicit, licentious, an idol that is worshipped. None of this has anything to do with agape. So what she's saying is, okay, let's finish this. Let's finish the section. In 19, for my husband, it's not at home. Okay, so he's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him. That means he's not going to be back for a long time and will come home on the appointed day. So what she's saying is, let's make an idol out of sex. Let's use grace as permission to sin. Let's focus on the flesh. Let's boil in passion and lust. Let's cheat what yeah yes thank you lust of the eyes lust of the flesh boastful pride of life it's the same old game same old thing make an idol out of sex we've turned We've made love about sex. It's been happening for generations. It's not like we did. I'm not trying to say we did it. It's our fault. We're the bad people. But in our society, it has become about sex. That began when we stopped doing this God's way, where we just started having sex whenever we wanted to, when we were dating or whatever, we started in high school and all that stuff, and we did it that way, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, I'm not saying that I'm innocent, but that's what we did. We devalued, because sex was supposed to be a part of love, something that was reserved for marriage and all this, but we devalued it, and then these things got all mangled up like Play-Doh. The colors are all mixed. You can't tell nothing about it. Hebrews says that the Word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it cuts and divides soul from spirit. It cuts, separates these things that are mangled apart. When you start walking with the Spirit, when you get into this relationship and develop some wisdom, and start building some understanding, these things start being separated out. Where you can tell the blue Play-Doh from the yellow Play-Doh and the red Play-Doh and the white Play-Doh. Get these things out. You can tell something about it. It's not just a conglomerate of mess. That's what happens here. Relationships start to make more sense. Friendships start to have more meaning. Marriages start to have more our relationship with God starts to become solidified. It means more. It means more to us. If you want something that you can believe in that you're willing to stand on this hill and die for... It needs to have real meaning. That's what he's calling us into. This is a cheap imitation for love, for relationships. It's cheap. That's not what your God wants from you. That's not what my God wants from me. What he wants is for me to love him and value him and prefer him. Because he loved and valued and preferred me. 
even when I was struggling in my own blood. Dead. Live. <laughs> Verse 21. With her enticing speech, I looked up that couple of words in Hebrew. You know what it means? Persuasive doctrine. How many of you know? Because uh, he told us here, he, he told us a couple of chapters back. He said, "I give you good doctrine." But how many of you know that if you don't stand for good doctrine, if you don't stand on truth, that you're going to believe something? We will worship something if it's ourself. Or, 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 or some movie star, or some athlete, or money, or wealthy people, or maybe even a social activity. As a lot of people go to church and it's a social activity to them, and that's not going to cut it. God wants to love you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. But her doctrine is a lot more pleasant to the ego and to the feelings, and to the emotion, than good doctrine. Good doctrine requires me to change. Good doctrine sometimes slaps me upside my head and says, you're wrong, and you need to change. And I don't like that. But she enticed him with her persuasive doctrine. And with her flattering lips that drip honey that says speech coming out that's smoother than oil. She seduced him. Okay, she seduced him to herself from what? You know if you're being seduced, you're, you're being seduced toward something and away from something. We got a whole nation of people that haven't stood firmly. They're trying to ride the fence. Well, I want enough of Jesus where I don't go to hell. I want my ticket punched. I'm willing to pray the prayer and walk up and embarrass myself and get dunked in the water. But as far as making sacrifices and being a radical believer that's going to follow him through whatever, I don't know if I'm down for all that. Well, all it takes is some flattering speech and persuasive doctrine that will lead you astray from that. And next thing you know, you'll wander right off into a place that's comfortable to your feelings. Paul told Timothy, he said, in the last days, they're, gonna, they're not going to entertain good doctrine. They're going to search for somebody that's going to tickle their ears. They're going to look to be entertained. I want you to make me feel good. I want this prosperity gospel to where you tell me that if I go name it and claim it or if I go to, and ask God, that he's going to drop boxes of money from the sky and bless my socks off and give me everything I ask for. Well, I got news for you. If you yield and commit your life to him, that could happen. Hey, I'm a spoiled, rotten kid. He gives me everything I want, but mostly what I want is to align with him. But everything that I need, some things I just want, I rarely have to ask for things or stuff. I've got everything I need. He has, his divine power has provided everything that I need for life and godliness. When I got ready to move out of here and take this house, I had nothing. I, I think that I had a good paycheck. I went to Walmart. I bought some towels and some washer eggs, a coffee pot, and a crock pot, and had that in boxes out on Brian and Tammy's carport. We decided we were going to move one day. We took off. That By the end of that day, I had everything in my house that I needed in a day. That's my God. Live. <laughs> Keep my commands. Value my sayings, my declaration, my promises, and live. I had a good job, but it wasn't a great job. But I was faithful to it. And when the well runs dry, I got a better job. I'm faithful to it. When this well runs dry, I'm sure I'll get a better job. Or maybe it'll be a worse job. I don't know. But it's all on his hands. Because I have everything I need. <laughs> she, 
She caused him to yield with her enticing speech, with her persuasive doctrine, with her flattering speech. She seduced him. Immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. There was a thing on Facebook uh, a year or two ago, and it was a picture of this. Is either a dog or a coyote or something, and boy, he was, he was chasing this, this bird, and he's running, boy, and he's focused on this bird, and this bird is flying, and he leaps after the bird, but he was at the end of the cliff. How do you think that's going to end up? The bird's cool. <laughs> That's what this guy did. So focused on her enticing speech and persuasive doctrine and the beauty of her eyes and the batting of the eyelids and the flattery and the ego stroking and the feel-good speech that he was focused on that and went right off the cliff. Immediately went after her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his liver, as a bird hastens to the snare, he didn't know it would cost his life. Now, therefore, I, I'm sorry, excuse me. Verse 24, now therefore, listen to me, my children. Listen to me, my children. Listen to me, my children. Who's speaking? Say it out loud. Who's speaking? God. Listen to me, my children, and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Don't let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't stray into her paths. For she's cast down many wounded. And all who were slain by her, hear this, all who were slain by her were what? They weren't weak men. They weren't inadequate men. They were strong men. They were men who should have been capable to withstand. It wasn't their strength that let them down. What was it that let them down? They didn't stand for good doctrine. They didn't stand for something, so they fell for something else. They fell for anything. You can't do that. We've got to stand on good doctrine. Now, my flesh is going to push back on that. It's going to fight on that. It's going to resist that. It's going to, I don't want to do that. That's just flesh. That's the struggle between flesh and spirit. There's hostility there. We've got to learn to stand for truth, put the feelings and the emotions and the ego in second place, put the Word of God and the relationship with Jesus and the process of wisdom as priority. Then these feelings and emotions will come along behind there, and it will all work out smooth, but it's not going to happen if you put the feelings and emotions first. If we put the enticing speech first, my feelings and emotion, this feels good, so I'm attracted to that, so I'm going to go for that. That's easier than this truth is. That's going to lead you like the dog over the cliff jumping after the bird, or like the ox to the slaughter, or the fool going to the stocks. That's what led me to prison. Well, I, I know, I know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I know that obedience to the word and a life in Christ is the way to go. But this dope feels good. This booze feels good. I want to do what I want to do. I want to be rebellious, and I don't care what the law says about it. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I don't know who would have had to pay for the plot. I guess they would have had to roll me up in a fence row because there wasn't enough money in the family to bury me unless Summer drug it up out of her retirement stuff or whatever. Her insurance stuff from work. But I didn't have any money to dispose of my carcass. But I didn't think about all that stuff then. I didn't think about anything that was right. 
But when I entered into this relationship with Jesus, the last thing I wanted to do was give up my best friend, which was booze and dope. Matter of fact, <laughs> matter of fact, I got a friend in here who could testify that for the first 90 days, I was mad about it. But I didn't put my feelings first. I put the truth first. The truth is that was killing me. The truth was that I needed a Savior. The truth was that I was separated from God. The truth was that I needed a relationship. The truth was that I needed a purpose that God had established in this life for me, and I needed to walk according to that purpose. The, pur the truth was that I needed this relationship. And the feelings and the emotions came along and trailed right behind what my beliefs were when I stood on my beliefs. The commandment was a light, and the law was a lamp. It doesn't always feel good. But it don't have to feel right to be right. But if you do what's right, it will feel right later. That's what we got to do. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth, and don't let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't believe her persuasive doctrine. I give you good doctrine. I want you to stick to the truth. Don't stray and wander like a vagabond into her past. For she's cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell and descending to the chambers of death. We don't want to go that way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. But there is a way that is right to God, and that way will give us life. Amen? Amen. So, let's stop pretending. Let's, let's stop pretending. Uh, 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 riding the fence, and uh, let's get into this thing because the curtain on time and history is closing slowly but surely. And we don't know how much longer it is before Jesus returns, but I don't want any of you people left behind. And so if this is a pretending thing, if you're not in this thing all the way daily, walking by the Spirit and not by the flesh, if you're not in the training process of wisdom, then get there. Because this is the way to life. And I love you. And I want you to live. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the wisdom of Solomon. The wisdom of the Holy Spirit, Lord. In this process, this word, this truth. Thank you for helping us to bear up under the opposition and the politics and all the stuff. Help us for strengthen us, Lord, to stand on your word so that we can live. We love you tonight, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.